and welcome to a joint meeting of the City Council and the Northampton School Committee, January 30th, 2020. I am Mayor Dr. Narkowitz, who is leading this meeting in accordance with our city charter, and I will ask our clerk this evening um, from the school committee to call the roll of the joint meeting. Starting with the City Council, Councilor Shara? Here. Councilor Quinlan? Here. Councilor Foster? Here. Councilor Nash? Here. Councilor Thorpe? Here. Councilor Jarrett? Here. Councilor Barge? Present. Councilor Mayori? And School Committee? Member Busanski? Here. Member Condon? Present. Member Fallon? Present. Member Gold? Present. Member Goldman? Present. Member Kaufman? Present. Uh, Member Levy? Present. Ma Mayor David Narcolis? Present. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox? Present. Your Honor, you have a call. <coughs> um, Mayor, can I just know, I don't think the Councilor Dwight was called. He wasn't called because I knew he wasn't here. That's very uh, accurate. <laughs> <laughs> just for a minute. So uh, yeah, here. Uh, Member Boss is not here either, and I did not call her either. So. Okay. Um, so thank you all again for convening this evening. Uh, this is part of the kickoff to our annual uh, budget process as outlined in the charter. Um, <coughs> Mayor is asked to call together a joint meeting of the uh, school committee and city council. Um, the superintendent is unable to be with us this evening. He's, um, at our high school this evening where he felt he needed to be because of some other um, really important issues that are happening there. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the superintendent of Smith Vocational and Agricultural, <coughs> Dr. Lincoln Hoger, is with us tonight. Uh, we also have um, uh, uh, our trustees as well as the business uh, manager for the um, um, Smith schools as well. Am I missing any of them? Excellent. Um, it's very hard to hear. Is there a, is there a microphone or we can turn up the um, she can turn up the feed in the building. Yeah. If, is that is that help? Is that better? Better. Okay. Um, I'll I'll try to speak louder. That's um, better. Thank that's you. Better. <laughs> Okay, so um, so my goal tonight is to go through some um, some of our uh, projections for revenue for our um, for our expenditures for the upcoming year, with the goal of sort of setting the stage for where we are in the development of the FY 2021 budget. Um, we have new members on both sides of uh, of this meeting tonight, so I will be going through. Um, you know some some background information on some of our um, some of our trends over a longer period of time, um, and I'll ask. Go ahead and turn the you know, lights off. Um, the added mood lighting is so that NCTV has proper illumination. So <laughs> it's a nice touch. Uh, or I should say Northampton Open Media. So that, that's what that's for. Um, so the agenda tonight is to go over some financial indicators relative to Northampton um, and some of our comparative communities, um, talk about some of our fiscal practices, um, review some of the key revenue and expenditure trends and projections for FY uh, 2021, um, discuss our fiscal stability plan and the March 3rd, 2020 Proposition 2.5 override, um, review our budget calendar uh, for this fiscal year, and then um, obviously open up to questions and comments um, from members assembled at this joint meeting. So um, uh, how does Northampton compare to neighboring communities on some of the key financial indicators? Um, this, is a, um, this is a group of communities that we have used for the last um, eight years, I believe. We selected them um, either because of their proximity to us or because they're similarly sized, have similar uh, <coughs> populations, um, uh, similar staffing patterns. We you'll see that we don't choose the city of Springfield because it's so much exponentially bigger than us, and obviously we don't choose some of the tinier hill towns near us um, because we want to have something that's representative of, uh, of our size. So s the next several slides will just kind of go through um, some of the comparators um, for Northampton. This is our residential tax rate, um, uh, and you can see uh, Northampton, oh, sorry, Northampton is in red. Sorry, new clicker. 
um, and, uh, and then you see all of the other uh, tax uh, rates of the various communities. We're at 1608. Last year we were in third place. Um, our tax rate actually went down this year following the revaluation. So we now find ourselves with the lowest tax rate. We do have data on where we fit in the, in the overall state. We're sort of in the uh, third, middle third of the state. If you look at the incomplete list of tax rates, um, commercial tax rate, we're similarly um, the lowest of our comparison uh, communities. Uh, average single family home value, uh, this shows you that the average single family home in Northampton is valued at 331,635. And then it goes down uh, looking at the various communities. You'll see where we rank there. You'll see the state, <coughs> which is well above any of us here in Western Massachusetts. Um, the two work together, the valuation, obviously, um, and, then the, um, and then the tax rate uh, which combine to figure out, you know, what the single family uh, tax bill is on a, um, on a home. So the value uh, applied to the tax rate um, gives us the, the average single family tax bill. So um, in Northampton, the average single family home tax bill for this current fiscal year is 5571 And you can see where we sort of match up on that scale of communities with Longmeadow and Amherst. Uh, the statewide average <laughs> and East Long Meadow higher than us, and then other the other communities um, below us with us right there. New growth. A new growth is what we talk about as part of the Proposition Two and a Half Law, where you um, where our levy grows by two and a half percent every year, plus any new growth, which is any new uh, building or construction or new homes or new factories that get built. Um, this shows uh, we have some of the strongest new growth in the valley. Uh, we're here in sort of first place at over a million dollars in new growth. Um, again, we've had strong new growth in the last several years, um, so that's a good thing. That's actually helped us in terms of extending our fiscal stability. Um, but again, that growth then gets applied to the tax rate. Um, and so you see how it plays out in terms of uh, tax revenue uh, generated by new growth. Uh, so we're not the, ta the top tax generator. We're third, though. Um, you still have Holyoke and Agawam ahead of us. Um, and then you see the other communities. So it sort of gives you a sense of where we are doing in terms of our economic development and growth, as well as tax uh, generated by new growth in the current fiscal year. This is per capita expenditures and per capita income. Uh, and then the latest data that was available to us on the DOR website was only 2018. We don't have anything more current. Um, again, just interesting to show uh, we're sort of in the middle third statewide uh, for both of these categories. And you can sort of see where we are um, placed overall. Um, I would point out one slight anomaly in the per capita income. It shows Amherst being a one among one of our sort of poorest communities per capita, but of course they're uh, counting the 30,000 undergraduate students at UMass that get factored into that equation. So that tends to, to push their, um, their per capita income much lower. Um, but again, you see our per capita expenditures and where we rank, again, 175th and 183rd out of 351 in those two categories. This is how the revenue in the general fund um, uh, by percentage of taxes, uh, local receipts, state aid, and other income. Um, this is really um, uh, important to look at. Um, Northampton is, um, uh, just want to make sure I'm getting the right button here. Um, Northampton is here. Um, and you can sort of see that of all of our general fund revenue, you've got this you know, over 60 plus percent that's coming from uh, taxes, um, and then 15.7% you know, that's coming from state aid. These other uh, local receipts are um, primarily our Smith Vogue tuition, which comes in and then goes over to Smith School, um, our ambulance revenue and our parking revenue, um, and then we've got a small amount of other income. Um, but you see that among these communities, other than Longmeadow, we receive the smallest portion of our uh, general fund revenue from state aid. Um, look at the flip side, 
of, of some other communities that receive, you know, well over close to 60 percent in the case of Holyoke um, in state aid. Obviously, some of that aid is need-based, so, um, but that just gives you a picture of the income mix of where our revenue comes from, but obviously heavily dependent on our taxes uh, to fund. So in terms of fiscal practices, um, and again, some of these slides you'll recognize if you've been to some of our town hall forums and if you've been um, to past, but we feel like it's important to kind of remind people of some of the, some of the goals and some of the overarching uh, policies that we set financially for the city, which play into our uh, overall budget decision-making practices. Um, we've talked about our general fund reserves um, and the fact that we've spent significant amount of time um, over the last uh, seven to eight years, uh, rebuilding our reserves after the last recession. Um, the reserve totals back in FY 2012 um, was $4,600 in our sort of emergency reserves. Um, and we made a point when we began uh, working on this back in the 2013 budget to slowly rebuild our budget, our reserves. Um, we've done that over time. It's resulted in our bond rating increasing, um, and it's also allowed us to um, have the financial flexibility that we've needed to address emergencies, to pay for capital expenses, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we do have policies, which you'll, we'll talk about in a later slide, about what our goals are for our reserves, um, and I'll, I'll outline that in a second to show you where we are in progress there. Um, obviously, this is a slide that you may have seen if you've come to um, the other town halls I've been talking about. Uh, this is from our uh, bond rating of May of 2019, uh, which goes over some of the reviews that we've been given by Standard & Poor's about our financial practices and our policies and our adherence to policies and the fact that we do uh, multi-year uh, not only budget projections, but capital planning, um, and that uh, you know our budget performance is strong um, overall. So this is just sort of an outside review of what goes into establishing what our bond rating is uh, and, and how that impacts our ability to borrow for large capital projects, whether it's school roofs or pavement or other, other needed um, capital projects. So this is the whole issue about our multi-year planning and our adherence to fiscal policies. Um, we do have uh, policies with regard to our free cash and our reserves, um, as well as debt and capital planning. Um, we have a policy of wanting to, main, or wanting to aspire to having, at a minimum, 10% uh, of our overall operating budget in our two main um, um, reserve funds, our, our stabilization fund and our capital stabilization fund. Um, we, are, we are at about 8.9% uh, right now, um, so we're not quite at our goal of 10%, but we're, we've obviously made significant progress. And then we have some target goals for debt service um, in terms of making sure that we are uh, maintaining proper levels of debt, um, not overextending ourselves. Um, and that we uh, make sure that we're paying uh, at least 50% of our outstanding principal within 10 years. Um, and again, we are, we are following all those policies. And those policies are actually provided to Standard & Poor's as part of the information that we provide to them with all of our audited statements. So they're checking to make sure that we're actually following the policies that we've set for ourselves as a city. This is free cash as a percentage of the budget. Um, so at the end of every fiscal year, uh, it's actually called the undesignated fund balance, but at the end of every fiscal year, um, when, the, when you know, June 30th comes and the new fiscal year begins, we are required to submit all of, our, um, all of our information about our revenues and our expenditures to the Department of Revenue. Um, there's a process that we go through, uh, and then eventually, usually in the late fall, they do what's called certifying our free cash, which just means that these are excess dollars that were left over um, that were unspent at the end of the budget uh, year. Um, and then those come back to us and we'll talk about what we do with those once they come back. Um, the, the best practice in terms of what we should be generating for free cash is between three and 5% um, each year. Um, this is the 5% mark um, and you can kind of see that we've sort of, you know, we're, we're between that three and a half and five percent. Um, I will point out that this last year, you'll see, is a sort of a, an aberration from the norm. 
Um, as we point out in the um, title, this was of course the year that the uh, retail adult use marijuana industry started um, midway through the a fiscal year before we had, after we had set our budget, after we had set our tax rate. Um, so we were unable to actually count any of that revenue in our, in our fiscal year uh, 2019 uh, budget. And so we ended up, um, you'll see in a later slide, that that revenue came back to us as free cash and then we have allocated it in a way that's actually helping uh, uh, sustain us longer under the fiscal stability plan. But that's free cash as a percentage of our budget. So this is how we've essentially used free cash over this um, period of time between 2011 and 2019. We essentially do three things with free cash. Um, we use a third of it generally for our capital uh, pr projects. Um, these are the one-time expenditures that we need to make, whether it's buying equipment, uh, replacing you know, networking devices in our schools, uh, paving, roofs, anything like that. Um, and each year we do a, f a ro rolling capital program uh, to, to, to come up with projects and needs in our city and, in our city and schools. Um, and so about this, this large uh, portion of uh, the free cash at the bottom is that's been de devoted to um, capital expenditures. We then also generally try to put a third of it into our um, reserve accounts, our stabilization accounts. Um, and then um, we have um, these green items are, these, are generally these unanticipated expenses that come up during a fiscal year, whether it's um, our snow and, and ice account, which we may overextend because of weather, and then we have to replenish our snow and ice budget. Um, <laughs> in this particular fiscal year, in uh, 2018, you may recall, uh, or you may not recall, that we had to make some repairs to our police station and police deck. Um, there was some significant leakage that we needed to address imminently. Um, we are. Um, in litigation to recover the cost of that, but we needed to make those expenditures. And then more recently, um, we were moved up rapidly in the Regional Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, the Damon Road Project was moved up a year ahead of schedule, and we needed to, as part of our local contribution to the project, uh, perform a series of um, acquisitions of land easements and construction easements that we needed to have in place in order for the project to go forward. So that was a case where we went to the city council. Um, this was, a, again, a one-time unanticipated expenditure, and so we used free cash for that. So that's an example of sort of those green ones that you see um, that, uh, that is one of the reasons why f free cash is important for a city to have. So in terms of revenue and expenditure trends uh, for fiscal 21, we're gonna look at what, what, Im what important you know, trends are important for us, um, what new revenue and how much new revenue will be available to us for the 2021 budget, um, what expenditures are protected to grow in 2021, and then what is the long-term budget outlook for the general fund. So this is our, our general fund budget as we sit in uh, 2020. Um, you can see the, um, where the revenues are coming from. Obviously, the largest uh, share of it is in taxes, uh, and that's uh, not only our property taxes, but excise taxes and other forms of tax. Uh, the next biggest um, area is state revenue, this 16 million, um, and then the uh, charges for services that I mentioned earlier um, is, the, is the next highest. And again, that's the Smith Boat tuition, the ambulance fees, and parking revenue. Um, I've pointed out in some of my town hall meetings, this little green sliver, uh, which is the adult use marijuana revenue that we're using in this current FY 2020 uh, budget year, um, lest anyone think we're not using it to fund this year's budget. Um, and then I've also pointed out federal revenues um, at 185,000, just to sort of give people a sense of how much the federal government uh, contributes to our uh, $100 million budget. So. Uh, taxes, and this includes um, property taxes and new growth. This is our largest, single largest revenue source. Um, 
Uh, we are estimating that to be about 64.6 .6 million in the FY 2021 budget. Um, you can sort of see the trend here um, of property tax revenue from 2014 uh, to 2021. Again, um, you know, under Prop two and a half, the way the revenue moves up. Um, this is the new growth number I was talking to you about, uh, which is uh, that, that capturing any new economic development, any new projects that are built, any someone puts an addition on their home, a new uh, subdivision is built. Um, I would point out, as you can see, it's very cyclical. It moves up and down. Um, you know, it was as low as, you know, in the 400,000s. Um, this year, we were seeing a million dollars worth of new growth, but three years ago, we were down in the 700s. So it's very much dependent on uh, the economy and what's happening in terms of building in the city. Um, so you can see the 10-year averages there in terms of what we are, um, what we've seen for new growth. Um, the other taxes that we talk about are excise taxes for motor vehicles, that's over here on the left, um, and then um, uh, meals and hotel motel. Uh, again, both of these are somewhat tied to, uh, to economic patterns. Um, you know, if you, you may have a car now that's a, whatever, a 2006, and you pay one excise tax rate, if you trade that in for a 2020 or 2019, you're going to pay more. So part of it's dependent on, are people buying more cars? Are they buying newer cars? Um, and so that can go up and down uh, depending on what's happening in the auto uh, buying market. Um, similarly with hotel, motel, and meals tax, it's dependent on you know, how much people are going out to eat um, and how much people are staying in our hotels. We have seen an uptick in our hotel and motel uh, recently, though we do believe that's probably attributable to the Airbnb uh, tax, which has been added to hotel motel. They unfortunately don't separate it out for us, but, um, but that's what we suspect we're seeing in terms of an uptick there, but we'll be watching that trend. And here's the adult use marijuana that, um, that I've, I've singled out because I know we get so many questions about it. Um, two different revenue streams. Uh, there is the um, local option excise, excise tax, which is 3% that's collected at the point of sale, um, is then sent to the Department of Revenue and then eventually gets sent back to cities and towns. It's actually sent the same time quarterly that they send the hotel motel tax and the meals tax back to us. Um, we've had four quarters of, um, of revenue so far. Um, these first two, these actually quarter three and four of 2019 uh, was the reference that I made to the free cash that I showed you before uh, that came to us sort of after the fact. Um, and then uh, the Q1 and Q2 have been built into the FY20 uh, budget. Um, we've, um, you'll note, we've, we have noted recently that the, the, the latest quarter has actually gone down. We were sort of trending at a certain level um, in both categories, but it did go down overall about $90,000. Um, we do think that that could be attributable to the vape ban, um, but we don't know long term um, what, where these revenue sources are going to end up. We're estimating, we used uh, 1.2 million in the current fiscal year budget. We're raising that estimate to 1.8 million as part of the 2021 um, budget. And again, we're still very early in the industry. There's 35 to 40 uh, retailers that are open across the entire state. We don't know what's going to happen to this revenue when there's 200 open across Massachusetts. And you know, we don't know how that's going to affect pricing or our market share. Um, so the other form of, of, um, of income that comes from uh, adult use marijuana is the host community impact fee. Uh, which is a five-year agreement that we make with each of the um, app, uh, license holders, um, and that is paid directly to us. Um, we, as part of our agreement, um, the, the money is supposed to be used to mitigate uh, direct impacts of the new operation upon the city's road system, law enforcement, inspection services, permitting services, administrative services, and public health services, as well as any potential unforeseen impacts upon the city. Um, we've put that in a separate stabilization account. Um, we have used um, close to 800. I think we've used the first two quarters that came to us in free cash. 
um, to basically um, fund some of the major uh, roadway and um, traffic safety improvements that occurred around NETA uh, over the last two years, including um, the repaving of Pleasant Street and Wright Avenue and Fulton Avenue um, and Hampton Avenue and sort of the network of sidewalks and, and streets and some crosswalk um, modifications uh, that we feel, you know, again, are within the nexus of the operation and have created more traffic. Um, note of caution about uh, this one, um, again, it's a five-year uh, revenue, so we don't build it into our general fund revenue, um, but even more of a caution, um, there's, there's, definitely, there's legislation that's making its way uh, through the legislature now um, to really try to give the Cannabis Commission more authority to uh, police the community impact uh, fee process and the host community um, agreements. Um, there was not a lot of guidance to, for anyone in this area when we began uh, back in 2018, um, and there have been concerns raised about um, is, is the law being applied as it was intended, as it was written. There have been some examples, not in Northampton, of, of um, uh, communities perhaps stretching uh, the, the bounds of what's allowable in terms of what they can collect in a community impact fee. Um, and I've heard that there may even be sort of a clawback of what is actually allowed and what has to be um, what has to be certified in order to actually collect a community impact fee. So that that could change. Um, at this point, we only have one person paying it, um, but going down the road, that could change uh, dramatically if the Cannabis Commission decides to implement new regulations around that. So that's just sort of a cautionary tale on that particular fee. Um, but that's how we're, that's how we've used the adult use revenue and how we estimate we will use it 1.8 million as part of the FY 2021 budget. So state aid is the second largest revenue source. And so this is the um, governor, as you may know, um, submitted his uh, HR2, which is the, um, his look at the state budget um, for FY 2021. Um, in terms of looking at our cherry sheet and what we see in terms of new revenues, um, we are seeing a 1.46% increase or $201,000 in, um, in additional um, or an increase in um, net aid over, uh, over last year. Um, I would point out, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, our chapter 70 number, um, which is right here, pretty much came in exactly as we projected at 1%, uh, or it's 1.012%. Um, because we are receiving the, the minimum $30 per child increase, uh, which is about $85,000. Um, that so that's essentially what our new Chapter 70 money is, um, and that again was baked into the Student Opportunity Act, um, which was minimum communities would receive a minimum of $30. Uh, dollars. And um, you may have been reading stories in the last several days about the Student Opportunity Act as various districts begin to see what their revenue is going to be and they unpack it and you know again it was it was essentially focused at the poorest um, districts and poorest communities in the state so really about 55 communities are seeing most of the revenue gains from the student opportunity act and there's close to 200 communities including northampton that are still minimum aid communities who will really only be seeing uh, this you know 30 dollars per child um, increase Net state aid, if you look at it, the full arc over the last, uh, you know, from 2002 to FY 2021, and we'll use the governor's budget as an example, you can kind of see um, how it's gone over time. Um, back in 2002, net state aid, and what I mean is we've, we've sort of backed out uh, school choice because that comes in and goes right to the school committee, that, that goes to the school committee to control. Libraries goes right to libraries. And then MSBA payments, which are basically um, the, the state share of our um, large school building projects, you know, doesn't, we don't get to spend that. It basically comes in and then goes right out as a payment. Um, so we sort of back those out um, to really see what our actual net state aid is. But you can see back in 2002, we were receiving almost 14 million um, in new aid. Um, we kind of 
went down a little bit and then got back up to like 12 million in FY 2008, but then pretty much we've dropped off and have been hovering around the $10 million mark over the last, you know, close to 10 years um, with really just minimal increases over time in net state aid. So that's obviously significant and a significant part of the stress on not only our budget but other municipal budgets when, you know, this one of your largest revenue sources is only growing at about 1% each year. <coughs> and, and your other, your largest revenue source is capped at 2.5% growth plus, uh, plus new growth. Charges for services are the third largest revenue source, so that's our ambulance <coughs> fees and our parking revenue. Um, you can sort of see the trend on ambulance fees over time. The 10 year average is 1.7, uh, about 1.8 million in um, ambulance fees. Uh, that we collect, and this is again when somebody is take, you know, it's, we have to pick them up in an ambulance. Um, they are they are charged through their, through their insurance company, and that revenue comes back to us to help us fund um, our operations, um, primarily our fire rescue department. Um, parking fee revenue, you can see uh, the ten-year average has been about 1.6 to 1.7 million. Um, we, we have seen an increase in the last couple of years. You may know that we raised the rate in the parking garage from 50 cents to 75 cents an hour. So we've incorporated that additional revenue in there. Um, but you know, we're using, uh, you know, the average has been about 1.7. So th those are our third largest uh, revenue sources, uh, ambulance fees and parking revenue. Indirect charges to the enterprise funds are the fourth largest source of our revenue in this in our budget. So um, the enterprise funds, the four enterprise funds that we operate, water, sewer, stormwater, and uh, solid waste, operate as independent cost centers and they're fee-based utilities. So you pay your water bill and all of the money from that, from collected for those um, water fees goes to fund the utility. But then there are indirect costs to the enterprise fund that aren't part of those fees, and those are um, things like the health insurance that is provided to the workers who work in the enterprise uh, funds and the utilities are provided by the city. So we, we then charge back those costs uh, to the enterprise fund, much like the indirect uh, charges work for the school department. Uh, where we file with the, with the uh, Department of Education every year to show the direct charges and the indirect charges. So it's very, very similar to that. That also includes um, all of the, um, all of the uh, accounting and legal services that we provide. We have made a concerted effort over the last 10 years to really <coughs> refine our indirect charges and make sure that they're truly representing the actual costs. So you've seen we've actually lowered our indirect charges to the enterprise funds. Um, and we have detailed uh, descriptions of how those are calculated in the, um, in the budget book. Um, but that is one of the revenue sources that, that comes into the general fund from the enterprise fund. And again, almost uh, well, 1.9 million estimated for FY 2021 as our fourth largest revenue source. Other significant revenue sources, um, uh, motor vehicle and parking uh, fine revenue, uh, 850,000. Um, I would note that uh, contrary to popular opinion, parking tickets are going down. Um, so it's not our goal in life to, make, to give out a ton of parking tickets. Um, I would actually say you're seeing the results of some of the new um, conveniences that we've added, whether it's credit cards, whether it's the, the, um, the the parking app that allows you to, you know, not just park your car without having to go to a meter or go uh, to a kiosk, um, um, and obviously the garage, you, you can't get a ticket in the garage. So we're, we've seen a little dip in the um, parking tickets. Um, and then over on the right is all of the building department uh, revenue. So people take out a permit for a building permit or a plumbing permit or a wiring permit. Um, again, these are very cyclical because it's all dependent on what's happening out in the larger economy. Um, you know, who's doing additions, who's building, um, you know, a new library, et cetera. So, um, so those are some of our other uh, significant revenue sources that go into building the general fund budget. 
So when we look at what are, what are we viewing as our estimated new revenue uh, for FY 2021, and we take what we think is our property tax revenue, this does not include the proposed override. Uh, we look at some of the other estimated increases in our local receipts. Uh, we look at what we think is going to happen, well, on the state aid using the governor's budget, and we kind of have to account for um, MSBA going away this year. We're actually making the final payment on the um, high school uh, debt exclusion override uh, and the 20 year uh, project that we had there. So we're making our final payment and MSA is, MSBA is making their final payment. So that's why it shows that number going down, but that's really just the MSBA <laughs> going away. Um, and then the fiscal stability funds that we use to basically backfill the budget this year um, is also part of that. So the total estimated new revenue uh, that we um, show without an override is $2,063,058. Uh, so that's what we're projecting as our estimated new revenue that we'll have to work with uh, to build this new uh, budget for FY 2021. Now we turn to the expenses. That's obviously the other side of the ledger. Um, this is what our general fund expenses look like uh, for the current FY 2020 budget. Um, education making up the largest portion of that. Um, employee benefits um, third, uh, second rather, as the second largest. Again, that's health insurance, retirement for both city and school employees. Um, public safety is our third uh, largest area. And then you get into you know, debt service, general government, you know, human services, some of the smaller departments. Um, I would note that because of those indirect expenses that I mentioned earlier, that um, the general, uh, the appropriation, uh, the direct appropriation to the school departments is not the full spending on education because we also pay for the employee benefits like health insurance and we pay for capital projects and debt service and other things as part of the general fund budget. Um, our actual um, spending on education is about 55.5% of the general fund budget. So again, 55 and a half cents of every dollar is going towards education either directly or indirectly in the current FY 2020 budget. Education is the city's largest expenditure. Um, and, uh, and you can see how that has uh, moved over time. Uh, this is showing from 2011 to 2021. Uh, this is Smith Vocational and this is NPS. NPS. Um, we are estimating uh, um, as part of our fiscal stability plan that we, would, that we need to spend 41.5 million um, combined for FY 2021 um, appropriation to our schools. Um, we are proposing in terms of the appropriation to NPS um, an increase of 5.41% and for Smith Vocational 5.29%. Um, and again, that, that equals a total appropriation of the schools of $2,122,144. Again, always our largest single expenditure item. Um, and obviously it's, it's one of the largest uh, services that we provide as a community is uh, K through 12 education and preschool. I mentioned the Student Opportunity Act earlier. It's sort of, we already referred to it a little bit, but obviously, um, you know, the Student Opportunity Act was propo <coughs> proposing to phase in 1.4 billion in chapter 78 over the next seven years. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, a high percentage of those uh, districts will remain minimum aid going forward. Um, again, I mentioned the governor's uh, 2021 budget provides us with, um, and this is just to NPS 85,740 increase. I believe Smith Folk is getting a $3,000 increase in chapter 78 um, under the governor's budget in chapter 70. Um, so chapter 70 uh, will continue to be one of the issues that we'll um, grapple with um, as we move forward. This kind of shows chapter 70 as a percentage of our net school spending over time. And you can kind of see how it sort of dropped down and has remained flat. Um, it's down around 16% and then it used to be 10 years ago, you know, over close to 23, 25%. This is actually the full uh, 10 year arc since chapter 70 went into effect. Um, and you can kind of see uh, the percentage changes over time, but really more recently it's been, you know, 1.4, 1, 1, 
0 0.98, 2.11, 1.13, 1.105, 1.08%. Um, so it's really been trending, particularly over the seven years during the stability plan, um, at about one to one and a half percent in our largest, um, one of our largest budget items and one of our largest um, mission areas as a city. No, 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 that's their increase. That is right. Their that's that's their entire increase is three. Yes, it is. Yes, in Chapter Seven. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so this is looking at Chapter Seventy Aid as a percentage of school spending. This is actually a Desi uh, chart, uh, which I think is really instructive, and it really kind of shows some of the pressures and what we're facing in Northampton. So um, the the blue. Uh, um, line here in the middle is the foundation budget. So this is what this is what Desi establishes as the foundation that um, that we should be looking at, sort of the base number that we should be looking at. Um, and then they apply a metric in terms of our wealth index and our value index uh, to determine what our share of, and they call it net school spending, needs to be. Um, and so um, what we need to spend, what we're supposed to be spending is, is right here, this is this dashed line, which is net school spending. Um, this little orange bar at the bottom is chapter 70. That's the state's contribution to that equation because they, they every community and the school committee members, we had a person from MASC show us how chapter 90 works, or chapter 70 works, um, and there's a whole equation that goes into figuring out um, how much the local contribution plus how much uh, Chapter 70 um, a community receives. Um, what we've actually been spending, though, is this solid bar up here, uh, which is sort of well above, um, certainly well above foundation budget and certainly well above uh, net school spending. We're, you know, 120% or plus over net school spending. Um, but the biggest factor, obviously, is, you know, we all know that the cost of education have gone up significantly, um, and you can see that the state's, uh, the largest, you know, state aid program to education has kind of remained flat while other costs have grown, and so again, it gets forced onto uh, local uh, school budgets and, and then by definition city and town budgets. So that's sort of a longer term look at how Chapter 78 has played out over time. Public safety is the second largest expenditure, uh, $14 million estimated in FY20 uh, 20 and 21. Um, blue is the police, red is fire rescue. Uh, and uh, and um, the smaller uh, bar down below is dispatch. Um, and you can kind of see over time um, how, that, how that line item moves, but that's again a $14 million uh, part of that 100 million plus uh, dollar budget. Health insurance is the city's third largest expenditure item. We're estimating we'll need to spend 11.5 million um, in FY 2021 to cover our health insurance costs for city and schools. And again, um, health insurance, that line item covers about 56% school employees, 44% city employees, just based on the makeup of how our employees are, are structured. Um, you can see that it's, you know, it's, uh, began approaching $10 million uh, back in you know, FY12, FY13. Um, we did move into the Group Insurance Commission in, for FY2014, uh, um, working with our employees, uh, and we were able to make some significant savings, um, and we've been able to maintain fairly stable increases, um, but still there have been increases, and still it is you know, over 10% of our general fund budget. So uh, to the extent that the healthcare um, market and, and healthcare costs continue to be a major state problem and national problem, um, it'll continue to be one of the pressures on Northampton's uh, budget every year. But we've worked to, um, uh, to try to contain those to the extent possible. But that's one of the big numbers that we'll be waiting for uh, later this spring um, is when we receive our um, when, when the GIC releases its various plan updates and what the rates will be. That'll be a major number that we'll be waiting for. But we've made some estimates based on multi-year um, 
uh, budgeting and some of the clues that they've been giving at some of their public meetings early on in the process. Retirement benefits are the city's fourth largest expenditure. Um, that's almost seven million that we're estimating in FY 2021. Prior to 1988, there was no real state laws governing um, how, um, how retirement benefits were paid. They were sort of paid on a pay-as-you-go um, basis. Um, a law was passed in 1988 uh, requiring that we needed to contribute not just to current retirees, but we needed to be um, putting money away for the future benefits. Um, um, and so um, we then had to basically then go back and catch up from between 1937 and 1988, and then obviously start future funding um, um, our employees um, going forward. The law requires that retirement systems be fully funded by 2040, um, and Northampton is on track to reach that goal, we think by 2035, we hope, we're not sure. Um, Peer Act, which is a state agency, um, that oversees all the retirement systems um, and they basically oversee and regulate um, both local and regional retirement boards um, and they basically approve um, all of, they have to oversee all of the actuarial tables and all of the other um, decisions that are being made by local retirement boards. Um, and you know, I think it's important to point out that our employees, um, who whether they're city or school employees who participate in the retirement system, um, they are contributing um, between eight to nine percent of their salary on the first thirty thousand, and ten to eleven percent of their salary over thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, they're not eligible to participate in Social Security. By contrast, Social Security people who are in Social Security are paying six point two percent. Um, into Social Security and their employers matching it. Um, and that the average annual pension for someone in the Northampton system in 2019 was $24,700 a year. So um, this is an obligation that we've made to our employees who've worked and given service to our community. Um, it's not an option, it's not uh, discretionary, and so it's one of the items that um, we have to um, make a contribution to, and you can obviously see um, those, um, those costs go up. The, the, um, depending on the stock market, depending on actuarial tables, every two years they're looking at what our contribution uh, needs to be. Um, but that is you know, our fourth largest expenditure item um, and again, it's not, it's not a discretionary, it's one of the fixed costs, uh, one of the fixed obligations that we have to pay every year. Debt service is the city's fifth largest expenditure. Um, so this is, again, um, at when we um, go out and borrow money to pay for big projects, whether it's school roofs or schools or, or paving or other uh, types of equipment. Um, we have a debt schedule and a debt plan and we have to then pay for debt service as part of our uh, general fund budget. We're projecting 5.5 <laughs> uh, million in FY 2021. 20, uh, You'll see this sort of orange and light blue uh, that are kind of happening up here. Uh, this is all of the debt that's being uh, paid for under the levy, um, meaning just as part of under the cap of Prop 2.5. Um, the light blue is, um, it would be a debt that we have used, uh, that we have um, gone to the voters um, and gotten an override to basically be able to borrow above that two and a half debt um, for major projects like JFK Middle School, the high school, the fire station, and the police station. Um, the orange here is actually the MSBA contribution to those um, debt projects, because the way it works is, or under the old system anyway, um, you know, we would borrow for the whole project and MSBA would, um, would pay their share as we went along. Um, you can see that um, uh, what is on the, ta above the, above the prop two and a half rate has slowly gone down as we've paid off each of those projects. Um, and then as we get here to 2020, we're gonna make our last payment on um, the MSBA payment will go away um, because we're making the last payment on the high school and then the only debt excluded project left will be the police station um, that's, that's uh, been excluded through an exclusion override. That little tiny sliver at the top which is in, in other sources, um, we are paying for a portion of the police station, the parking deck portion of the police station with parking revenue. 
Um, so that's that's why it's coming from a different source other than other than taxes. But that was one of the um, one of the ways that we were able to fund the police station and and add the parking deck on. Um, so that shows you debt service as one of our fifth largest expenditures. State charges are the largest, sixth largest expenditure. So again, these are all the, the charges that we pay um, going out for everything from you know, regional transportation um, to uh, uh, um, air pollution um, districts, um, obviously um, school choice sending tuition and charter school sending tuition are part of that as well. Um, and this is the, all of these numbers, the cherry sheets that we get, um, they will get new cherry sheets every time another budget gets introduced. So um, there's one when the House introduces a budget, and, I mean, when the governor introduces a budget, and then one when the House, and then the Senate, and then the conference committee. Um, so some of these numbers will change over time. Um, they're looking at student counts for student choice and for student, uh, for, for uh, charter school, mostly based on last year, and then they're going to slowly start adding. Uh, those numbers may change over the next over the next several uh, months as we get new cherry sheets. But interestingly, they are showing a slight decrease overall, um, and they're showing a slight decrease in the number of kids going to charter school this year, which is a good thing. We hope it's real. We don't know what's going to happen when, when we get the latest update to the cherry sheet. But there, we're showing um, a decrease of 184, 882 overall in state charges in that sixth largest expenditure uh, group. So that's good that it's not going up um, exponentially. So when we look at estimated new expenses for 2021, when we look at the major investments that we want to make in our school departments and we look at um, what we're estimating as increases for city departments, uh, the debt service, the employee benefits, the insurance, um, some of the other, uh, the state charges that I just talked about, um, we, we come up with an estimated expense um, of 3,185,281 in new expenses as part of the fiscal year 2021 uh, budget. So, um, obviously, you can sort of do the math there in terms of what we have available for revenue. Um, and we basically, as, as I've been discussing at, at some of the town halls, we are currently estimating preliminarily uh, that, we will, uh, that we will have um, a, a shortfall of revenue of $1,122,223 as we look to build um, our FY 2021 um, budget. Um, and again, this is, you know, this would be the third year uh, where we've had a shortfall as we come to, um, as we come to make our budget um, as part of the fiscal stability plan. So how does, so essentially that shows you the math um, based on all of those larger uh, revenue areas and some of our other estimates. So that leads us, of course, to the aforementioned fiscal stability plan um, and the proposed March 3rd, 2020 Proposition 2.5 override. So when we look at what we are projecting in putting forth the um, in putting forth the $2.5 million override, we're basically projecting that we can fill that gap and we can then extend our fiscal stability for an additional four years. Um, the original fiscal stability plan, which we began in FY 2014, where we asked the voters for an override larger than the gap that we had at the time, and then we stockpiled revenues in order to buffer in the out years. We're basically asking to renew that um, uh, because we've reached basically the point where um, it's no longer uh, uh, fiscally safe to continue without another infusion of additional revenue. Um, so the $2.5 million override uh, would allow us to extend the plan. We are estimating, again, by an additional four years, um, which would bring us out into uh, 2025. Um, so that is what we are proposing, and that would be, the, in my view, the best case scenario if the voters um, accepted the renewal of the plan and voted in favor of the $2.5 million override. Obviously, if the decision of the voters is to not pass the override, um, and we then decide we will move away from the fiscal stability plan model, um, then of course the cliff that you've heard me talk about uh, for several years is no longer off in the distance, it's right there. 
Um, and I've described this in past years as sort of a roller coaster. You sort of are going up slow, uh, but once you start to descend and start to then uh, rely on the fiscal stability uh, to be able to maintain your budgets over time, um, you begin to accelerate quickly. And so um, the $1.122 uh, million deficit is here. Again, if we, um, if we continued on the same trajectory, we begin to see bigger and bigger uh, revenue deficits over time in trying to maintain um, the services that we've been providing in both our cities and schools. So taking that, taking that $1.1 plus million dollar uh, gap and just generally applying it to um, how general fund dollars are allocated um, generally, um, and again, really just looking at departmental budgets, because as I've discussed earlier, um, uh, the other large budget areas are not really discretionary. We can't really cut our retirement contribution. We're, we still have to provide our health insurance. Uh, we still have to make our debt service payments. Like those, we don't get to cut those. Um, so of the three largest revenue areas, really it's the departmental uh, budgets that would have to absorb. So uh, this is sort of just doing the math, applying the percentages. Um, it shows you where we would need to make reductions in order to bring the budget um, into balance. Obviously, um, schools being one, oh, sorry, schools being one of the largest areas, um, public safety, uh, second, about, you know, about 600,000 to NPS about 300,000 in the area of public uh, safety, um, general government about 114,000, and then you know obviously smaller departments um, as a percentage of the overall budget seeing um, you know smaller shortfalls. This is just really for for illustrative purposes. We've obviously haven't started the budget process, um, but I know that you know in talking with uh, the superintendent and Cami. Um, one of the things they're working on as part of their first view budget, which they bring to the school committee uh, next February uh, in February, um, is is sort of a multi a dual scenario. Um, one that shows with the fully funded budget that we propose, um, and then one if we if an override failed and we need to, needed to make reductions um, to account for. Uh, that revenue shortfall. And I'll obviously be working um, on the city side, um, looking at similar projections. Obviously, March 3rd is when the override um, ballot will occur. Um, so we'll have some pretty immediate information um, at, in 32 days on what we will have in terms of actual revenue uh, to put together our budget. Um, the city clerk today just received copies of the specimen ballots. So um, it's no longer hypothetical. This is, this is the actual copy of what the ballot looks like. It's a very simple question. Shall the city of Northampton be allowed to assess an additional 2.5 million in real estate and personal property taxes for the purpose of funding the operating budgets of the city and public schools for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020? And obviously, yes or no um, is, the, is the choice. Um, as for some of you who've come to our town hall meetings, we've tried to provide sort of an information about what that would represent um, in terms of impact on our residents and the constituents that we represent. Um, looking, isolating the additional $2.5 million in revenue um, and how that would impact the tax rate. Um, uh, it would actually, it would add, we estimate 0.67 cents to that per thousand tax rate that we looked at earlier. Um, and then if you then apply that to the average single family home in Northampton, it would work out to be about $225 more a year or $56 per quarter. Um, we've got this little uh, chart that kind of applies that for you know, a home that's generically valued at 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, on up to 500,000, broken down annually and quarterly because obviously we make our payments quarterly. We do have a tax override calculator on the city website, which um, your residents and constituents can actually type in their name or their address. Um, this happens to be my uh, property, Narkowitz David J. Um, it shows you what my assessed value is and then it calculates what that additional uh, 2.5 million, uh, which works out to be about $50 uh, per quarter from my particular property. So we, we've tried to give people tools for understanding what that actually means. Um, we've also added some property tax relief 
um, an extended property tax relief for income eligible seniors in the city, uh, reducing the age of eligibility from 70 to 65, increasing maximum exemption amounts from 650 to 1,000, and we've raised income limits and asset limits uh, uh, for single and married persons. And there's a num number of other programs that we're referring uh, people to call the assessor's office because obviously one of the things we want to be very sensitive to is uh, to the extent that we can under the law, mitigating possible income, uh, possible impacts on our low income uh, senior population. So, um, as I conclude all of these, uh, uh, all of these um, uh, shows every year, all of the information that we have um, that sort of builds into this is on our city website. All of the budgets, which include all the school budgets, all of the capital improvement programs, all of the annual audits, uh, from our outside auditor, all of the bond ratings and trust fund reports. We have an open checkbook. Um, and then we have a visual budget program, which I've, I've tried to really promote. We've tried to promote it for several years, but really this year it feels like it's really important uh, for people to understand because it allows you to go in, put in how much you pay in taxes, your specific tax bill, and then actually get to see in dollars and cents how your particular tax dollars get spread across the city budget. How much goes to the schools? How much goes to the fire department? <laughs> how much goes to Forbes Library? How much goes to Lilly Library? How much goes to you know, debt service, et cetera? Um, and it really lets people um, boil it down and actually get to see how their tax dollars uh, get spent. And I think it's really important for people to understand that uh, because really the budget that we all put together um, is really a reflection of all the services um, and, and frankly, um, the values of our community in terms of the types of services people want, the types of school people want, and then sort of the forward-looking forward planning and visionary city uh, that people want um, in terms of everything from sustainability to shade trees to you, you name it. Um, so those are resources that are always available, but obviously during the budget season, uh, we always want to send our our, our constituents to them if they, if they need more information or they doubt that there's not all this information available at their, at their fingertips. The budget calendar for this year, and again, this is mostly prescribed by charter. The dates for all of these things are, are prescribed under the city charter. Um, we're tonight doing the first part of that process, which is the kickoff meeting, a uh, joint meeting of the city council and school committee. Um, I noted that uh, February 27th, the superintendent will be presenting the first view um, NPS budget to the school committee. Um, uh, March 3rd, obviously, not a normal part of our budget calendar, but it's an important part of our budget calendar this year. Uh, that's when voters will go uh, to the polls across the city um, in the presidential primary, but there'll also be a separate municipal ballot um, for the proposition two and a half override question. Um, then April 17th is the deadline for both the NPS and Smith Vocational to submit their budgets to the mayor. I then have a month to compile them all together into one overall general fund budget, which I'm required to submit uh, to the city council by May 17th. And then the city council has obviously until June 30th uh, to hold a hearing um, and vote on a proposed, um, obviously we didn't update that, it's actually 2021, we'll fix that. Uh, but, but, but vote on a proposed budget for the new fiscal year, which begins the next day on July 1st. Um, I've mentioned the town hall meetings uh, for people and constituents that want to learn more specifically about that key date on March 3rd. I'll kind of leave them up there. Um, hopefully you'll share them with your constituents. I've done three already. They've been well attended. I have three scheduled for next week. Um, and at this point, I would uh, turn the floor over uh, to the two bodies and open it up for questions. And we're gonna turn the lights on. Whoa, sorry. Um, <coughs> Councilor Sh President. Um, thank you, as always, for this very detailed presentation. Um, I have a question on back, going back to the marijuana uh, revenue. So um, we know that it was estimated at 1.2 million in FY20, and so it's estimated as 1.8 million revenue for 21. Um, 
can you just talk a little bit about how you got to that number? Because we, we, we know that the market's getting diluted, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we also know that we saw a bit of a decrease. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the revenue for the first four quarters um, split across those two years was 1.9. So this yeah. is slightly less, but not that much less than but that yeah, kind yeah. of very robust revenue from that person. No doubt about it. And that's uh, that was a preliminary estimate that we're making right now. And obviously, we're going to get one more quarter to look at. Um, so we'll be sort of trying to look at that as well before we finalize, you know, before we finalize the budget. So that may change. We may have to adjust that revenue. I know the finance director is is um, worried about that number. Um, you know, we do have another, um, we will have a second retailer opening um, in Northampton. I have it on good authority that um, the Cannabis Commission will be voting on another retail license um, very shortly. So that'll be interesting. Again, we've all been wondering, well, if a second one opens, um, will that mean more revenue or will they just be sharing the revenue, the existing revenue? Um, so far, we haven't seen um, you know, even when, when dispensary or retailers have opened in Amherst or East Hampton or Chicopee, we haven't seen a significant dim diminishment in customer base. Um, but so, yeah, that is definitely a number that we, uh, we actually arrived at that number and then the fourth quarter came in and we saw that decrease. So that, you know, gave us some pause. Um, but again, it was right smack dab in the middle of the vape ban that the governor instituted. Um, and Netta has told us that that did have a significant impact because many of their customers, you know, use vape to to um, to use either medical or or recreational marijuana. Um, and actually, it's going to also um, be part of the next quarter as well. It kind of straddles two quarters. Um, but that is a concern. Um, but we are um, so we may revisit that number and we may have to revise it down depending on what the next quarter looks like. Um, yes. Um, I have um, member Levy first, and then I'll come back over here. Yes. Um, so this is a question from a constituent who is asking about the amount that goes into the reserve funds. Mm -hmm. And um, the question had to do with whether, um, whether it, it makes sense for us as a city to maybe have, you've done a good job of, of showing what the benefits are of having that fund and and that we're not quite where we'd like it to be but we're on track and we're close um, the question was does that fund need to be as as strong as it is projected to be is that an area where perhaps we don't have as strong of a bond rating but that's okay we still would be able to do all the things we want to as a city and simply have less of a rainy day fund can you give me some resources to respond to sure that? yeah so I mean the um the bond rating actually does have an impact on our general fund budget because when, so, you know, this year we, um, we're, we're going to bond, um, <coughs> well, I think we'll use last year as an example where we did two and a half million dollars in paving, basically. And so um, we, that, that bond call rating that we did that gave us that, that updated rating, um, then our bonds are basically sold on the bond market. They're put out for sale. There's actually an auction that's held for municipal bonds, and so people look at our rating, and basically they're 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 um, they're bidding on it. And basically the result of that, um, what they're willing to pay, is basically the interest rate that we'll pay um, on our on our pro whatever the project it is. Um, and there's some significant difference between how much interest you pay. It's almost like a credit rating score, you know. So if you have a bad credit rating score, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna pay much more in interest on your car loan or your house loan, or, God forbid, you have to go to a payday lender or you know whatever it is. Um, and so we've been able to get really low interest rates on our borrowing, um, which then means less uh, debt service. So that means less operating monies that are getting diverted to debt service. So it actually has a real and measurable impact on the general fund budget. Um, and then there's just the financial st uh, stability piece of it. Um, you know, I showed a couple of examples where we've had to use money on an urgent basis. Um, but you know, there's there have been other examples in the past where you know you have, you know, a, a you know snowstorm in October that takes out your power and knocks down all you know your trees. And so we've had to res rely on reserves for those kinds of situations. And I guess what I would say is that you know 10% is sort of the 
kind of the minimum recommended that, you know, it's sort of like when they tell you you should have 10% of your salary in an emergency fund, that's sort of a similar metric. So I don't think having 10% is excessive. I think it's right where we should be. And, um, and I can't even imagine um, what my predecessor must have, how she would have been, how she slept at night um, and this was not, it was, be, these were measures beyond her control. This was like a worldwide recession. But to be the mayor of the city of Northampton and know you had $4,600 in the bank, um, that must have been, that was, I mean, I was on the city council, so I was part of that government, so I understand it. But that was after state aid got cut, you know, mid year and after we basically had to decimate our reserves to keep from laying off, you know, tons and tons of staff. So. Um, so having reserves, particularly knowing that recessions are very cyclical um, and, you know, we don't know when the next 2009, 2010 period might come. Um, we've got that um, gentleman driving the head of state right now who we don't know what's going to happen in terms of what may happen and, and what it may do to the financial market. So that would really be my response. I know it's hard. Um, it's people. You know, it's like saving in general. Like it's a, it's sort of a discipline in how you budget. Um, but it really, you know, it's 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 part of what we have to do. Um, you know, and you know, well, on the school committee side, um, you know, we we receive school choice money and we use that as sort of our emergency reserve. Um, and the same way, we have to be really um, careful about not overextending. Um, too much of those funds because we don't know if, a, you know, there could be a new student that comes into the district and suddenly we have a major new expenditure. So, or a bus breaks down or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so again, I think that's why we are being prudent. Um, but I don't think we're being excessive by any measure. Um, I think we're just trying to rebuild our reserves and have them at a, at a safe level. So that would be my response. Yep. And then coming back to Councillor Jared and then Councillor Quinlan. Uh, following up on that, uh, do you have exact more exact numbers on the bond rating? You know what, what, what the percentage difference is now that we have a AAA is. Or can yeah, you we, get those? We took that slide. We had it in a. We've we've okay. had it in a. We've had it in past presentations. I can get it to you. But our but our bond rating um, agencies, when we go out to bond, um, they'll often report back to us on how all of their various clients did in terms of bond rate. Um, and so we've got some data on that we can share with you. We just, we didn't, I was trying to cut the slides down, so we didn't include it. Okay. Um, but we do have slides that show that and show, you know, pretty significant difference in terms of what we were able to get as a bond rate versus other communities. Um, so that, we can try to get you that data. Um, and then the marijuana impact fee, I noticed in the slides the excise tax and the impact fee are different, even though they're both supposed, both supposed to be 3%. Um, it's about sixty-five thousand dollar difference in. The yeah, that's it's a it's a part of it is um, it's the it's the lag time in collection. So um, even though we get the money on you know the the traditional quarterly dates, it's actually um, monies that are like two years early, two months earlier because of the way it's collected at the at the. Um, so there's like a slight difference between when Netta pays the. Um, host community, they're paying on actual quarters, but the same quarter, they're not the same quarters is basically what I'm saying. It's not the same set of four quarters because of that two month lag time. Um, I can I can show you a chart that explains it, but okay. it's 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 odd because typically like, you know, the, the third quarter of the fiscal year would be um, January, February and March. Um, but when we got our third quarter payment, it actually was for November, December, January. November, December. November, December, January. Um, and that's because, you know, you know, I buy my chocolate bar in November, um, but we don't get the sales tax until, you know, two months later. Uh, so, that, so that's why the numbers don't quite match exactly. But yeah, the, I've been asked that by the newspaper and that explains the difference. Um, and um, and I, I just want to say that that's one, you know, one of the issues with the um, mitigation fee is that the law says up to 3%. Um, you know, it says up to 3% to cover actual costs of mitigation. And that's become one of the big issues because most of us who, you know, we had to sign these agreements, you know, before any of the stores even opened, um, pretty much all said uh, 3%. <laughs> like that's what we sort of all just use 3%. Um, and it's very vague. 
Well, now that the industry's been open for a while, um, there's been a call for, well, you know, shouldn't it actually be more focused on actual impacts? You know, like what are the actual impacts? And I don't know. I think um, I think Councillor Foster was with me in the MMA uh, seminar, and they were talking about a new regulation that's actually going to require cities to actually document their their expenses um, in terms of impact. So. Um, so we may see some radical changes in that area in terms of it not being 3% and I don't know what it might be. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to, I wanted to use your comment as an opportunity to just point that out as one of the big changes that might be coming. Because everybody just sort of said, we'll do 3% because that was like the maximum available. Um, but it's supposed to be up to 3% and it's really supposed to be representative of actual impacts. So. And the last question about the impact, um, so there's you know, a gr great concern about increased youth use of marijuana. Um, yep. How much of our impact fees are being spent on programs? Really? Yeah, that's something that, um, well, something I'm going to be discussing with our health director. Um, she and I have been talking about that in ways that we may be able to use that. We have used some funds from NETA um, to fund the Prevention Coalition. Um, they did a um, safe storage campaign um, and actually created safe storage literature um, with monies from NETA um, that they then actually NETA distributed to their customers, um, basically about around making sure that adults safely stored their purchases and kept them out of the hands of children. But that is definitely one of the areas that we're talking with um, our health director <coughs> and the prevention coalition about how we can use it on responsible use and um, underage use of, of marijuana. So definitely that will be part of the equation. And then Councillor Quinlan, and then I'll come back. I, yep, so just following up on that uh, <clears throat> with the host community money. So you're, we're talking about investing in a program. What else are we investing in, in the future with that money? You, you mentioned that we kind of updated the neighborhood around NETA. Yeah. What, what else? Well, th that's part of the conversation that we're having. <laughs> We've used up two of those quarters, and that's going to be and it's it, we the city council did set up a dedicated fund to put those monies in. So it's all self-contained. And then it's basically subject to appropriation that I would bring items to the city council um, and ask for your approval, whether it is a prevention campaign. Um, you know, again, uh, I'm trying to adhere to the letter of the law and adhere to the contract that we sign um, and make sure that we're doing it in a way and especially since we're now seeing that there's going to be some reporting requirements that we actually have to show a direct, you know, association to the project. Um, so, you know, that those are some of the things we're exploring with NETA and also our public health department about other potential impacts we could look at. And then uh, you mentioned that you have it on good authority that the next license will be voted on shortly. Uh, how many other licenses in Northampton are going to apply for? So. Um, um, if you look on, we have a web page devoted to um, adult use uh, marijuana and medical marijuana, and we've got it sort of broken down by category. We have several medical, we have several retailers. Um, I'd have to pull it up to give you the exact count. We have, we have a, um, a testing lab that has filed an application. Uh, we have a growing facility um, that has uh, filed an application, and we have several small um, producers that are going to make product. They're sort of the middle person that will make product for retail sale. Um, and so there's a complete list of all of those as, and copies of the um, host agreements on our website. Um, I think we're, I think we're, we may be at nine or ten citywide, um, just retail. But again, I have a complete list. I just can't cite it for you right sure. now. But it's all there and you can read all the host community agreements. Oh, actually, uh, through the wonders of modern technology. Susan, um, ask you. So we have one, two, three medical uh, applications in, actually, although NETA is one of those, so that doesn't really count. Um, and then in terms of other retail, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten others that have filed applications. Um, product manufacturing, uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, product manufacturing, uh, including Stoned Puppy LLC, which is one of my favorites. Um, Fernway is another one I like. Um, and then cultivation, we have Just Healthy and Community Growth Partners, and then we have one independent testing laboratory. 
So that's sort of the full uh, panoply of applications. I would say, though, um, many of these applications have been <coughs> pending for a long, long time. Sure. Yeah. Um, and these folks are paying rent um, in many cases on retail spaces. And that's been one of the concerns at the state level is that the process is taking so long, which is freezing out at all but the most wealthy applicants. And so we don't actually know if, if how many of these will start to fall away. We'll try to sell their license. We've already seen a couple licenses kind of be sw swapped or moved to other parts of the state where they felt they had a better chance of getting a license. Um, so there's a lot of movement and, um, and we, I, we don't actually know how many of these are real and how many will actually see the finish line. So, Thanks. Member Kaufman. Thank you. We have, a new, we have a new nomenclature for what we call <laughs> each other. I have to think about it, so Member Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, solid presentation. Um, Thank you. Just a comment and then a question about debt service. Mm -hmm. So just a comment in relation to Member Levy's constituent. Um, I think what you left out in terms of the rainy day fund was you had promised us or you had projected that we'd get four years from mm -hmm. the last override and it lasted six, right, or seven? Seven. Seven, yeah. yeah. So seven it's really an unbelievable testament to a number of things, responsible spending being one of them. And yep. responsible spending, I think, is attributable to not spending the rainy day fund. Yes, and so, growth as well, right. yeah. So, yeah, it's a number of reasons, but I think um, we would be having this conversation. Three years ago, mm -hmm. if we spent all the rainy day money, we would have better services, I guess. I'm not sure what, this, what the money would have been used for, but I think it's a credit to you and the city council's responsible spending that stretch it out for three more years. I would Thank you. That. Um, so regarding the debt service, are there any other projects coming off that that you've been able to that you worked into your budget? Like I think you mentioned the high school, I don't know where we are with the firehouse or JFK or um, police station. Yeah. What else is happening with that? Because that's a pretty significant amount. Is that gonna go down or is that? So that, that, what that basically does, and again, that's not part of our general fund obligation. It's, 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 the, uh, it's the debt excluded portion of our, of our levy. So that's where we basically got permission to exceed two and a half to make those payments. So those will actually go off the tax rate. So people's tax rate will go down as the high school gets paid off. And then the only one left will be uh, the general fund. So it, I mean, um, I guess it frees up capacity in one sense that it, the, the tax rate should go down, but we're still capped at two and a half percent in the general fund. So the only way to go above that you know, would be to do another exclusion. We don't have any large scale projects planned in the future. Uh, we don't have, you know, any other major building projects. Mm -hmm. we, we do have a debt schedule and you mentioned, I, I mentioned that we try to uh, make sure projects are paid off in 10 years. And so the capital improvement program, which is this, you know, big five year document, um, as a project, we're trying to make sure that we stay within responsible debt limits um, and we're not overextending ourselves, but as a as project as we see a project coming off, then we say, okay, we could build this other project in. So we're not looking to raise that significantly, but we are looking to manage that to use that debt schedule responsibly to work in new projects. And paving is really, I mean, it, paving has been one of the big things we've been doing. Yeah. I mean, that's been the big thing because again. I don't have the slide here tonight, but like the Chapter 70, our state aid for paving has just been flatlined. Um, and so we've fallen further and further behind. And so we've decided to spend more and borrow money, use that bond rating to borrow to fix these big roads, like the ones in your ward and wards all over the city. So, um, and again, you pay more, you, the more you defer, the more expensive it becomes. So, um, so anyway, that would be my response on that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I Councilor have, Foster. I have two questions um, that I think are relatively related. Um, a number of the slides you showed us in comparison to similar cities and towns in Western Mass. Um, but I didn't see, so we're spending about 55.5% of our budget for the schools. And I'm curious how that number compares with similar cities and towns. Mm -hmm. And then kind of piggybacking off that, the additional uh, $2 million for the schools proposed. I'm curious how 
that number was arrived at and what that will mean for our schools if, if um, just a broad sense of what the focus of that spending will be. Yeah, so um, the, the, um, the pers so we, we'll, um, we have had slides in the past that have shown like what net school spending is and what percentage of spending on schools and I can, we can, we can get you that data. Uh, we, were, we were at, once we hit 50 slides, we thought, yeah, no, we shouldn't go above that. There's like a there should be there's like a human rights law about uh, 50 <laughs> slides you know, power and then point. look at us asking for them. Well, it's true, yeah. I know, but like it's just you never know which ones you want. So it's like so we tried to yeah. So but we can get you um, we can show you that data. Um, obviously, there's a lot of factors there, um, including you know um, uh, you know the way that the Chapter 70 formula works. Um, we on the school committee had a. A presentation about how Chapter 70 works recently, and they kind of compared two cities like Gardner, Massachusetts, and Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, and you could see uh, just the stark difference in how much more, um, you know, both are spending well on their schools, but how much more of Gardner's spending comes from Chapter 70 versus, um, versus Northampton. So, um, so those numbers, we can show them, but but it's all the, that other piece of the formula has to be taken into account. So we'll try to provide you some perspective on that. Um, and then your second question was about the additional um, proposed yes, two, exactly. two million. So yeah. so the um, so what we're proposing the the significant increase uh, to our to our school budgets. Mm -hmm. um, the five point four percent or five point four nine percent. Um, we believe is what we need to uh, maintain, uh, you know, the proper growth of our of our budget for the schools to pay for all of the services and staff, as well as make other uh, meet other fixed cost obligations um, going forward. Um, and so, in terms of what that looks like, in terms of relativity to other um, increases, uh, that would be um, actually. Larger, a larger percentage increase than even in FY 2014 after the override. Pretty sure that is the case. Um, I have to recheck that because we've changed that percentage. And it would be the largest single appropriation to the, to the schools since uh, 1989, I believe. Um, so we're making a significant investment um, and we believe it's important to keep the forward momentum that we have in our schools. And if you've come to the town halls, um, I've been talking a lot about the progress we've made in our schools over the last seven years um, in terms of um, not only academic achievement, but, but really doing a better job of serving um, children with social emotional needs and with ELL needs and, and trauma and all the other factors uh, that go in. And so I believe we've been able to demonstrate that by investing more in our schools, adding more staff, uh, that we've been able to show um, improvement, and so we don't want to. We don't want to go backwards. We want to continue to move forward. Um, so that's really what that story is about. Obviously, I'm the, on the city side. We're presenting the overall budget number, but the superintendent and then working with the school committee will be figuring out how it's allocated. Um, but in terms of the superintendent sitting down to sort of work on his first look budget, um, that's sort of the the area that we've given him that he thinks he needs to, to do what needs to happen in the schools. Um, so that's the answer to that. Ms. B Member Busansky, <laughs> sorry. I'm so I'm curious if you could just speak to why the, um, the hotel motel tax, I think, and meals tax were either going, estimated to go down or flat next year in the next year's budget and also, how that relates to vacancy rates in Northampton, and I, you know, there's been lots of talk and articles, et cetera. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think the last slide was actually FY20. Uh, like okay. The end slide. I there was, was an estimate there, yeah. wasn't there? A bar that was an estimate. Yeah. If you, if you can just tap it for me, it'll come back. To, it's, it'll wake up. I think. Is it waking up? Well, um, do you have it in front of you, Susan? Let me just see if I can wake it back up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lullaby, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah, so 
so one of the problems with some of these slides is that these are um, all the first bars are actuals, the mm -hmm. actual, and then 20 is an estimate because we're in the middle of right. 20 right now. Right. Um, and so we tend to, by using multi-year estimates, we tend to use you know the num an, an estimate that's lower than what we got the previous year, um, or we look at multi-year trends. So. Um, in that area, actually, uh, the 10-year average is 1.2 million. Uh, we're actually going to use a slightly higher estimate because we've seen in the past couple of years actually an uptick in, um, in, in hotel motel tax. So meals tax um, has actually been pretty strong the past several years in actual collections. Um, but again, because we are always trying to make sure we don't overshoot the mark, we were using a slightly lower estimate for 20. So we don't know what the actuals will come. Um, but in terms of vacancies, I mean, the vacancies downtown, uh, we've had, uh, first of all, they're all paying property taxes. They continue to pay property taxes. Um, with the exception of one uh, particular landlord, um, whose name I won't mention, um, we've actually had a lot of turnover in our, in our downtown in terms of vacancies occurring and then new businesses moving right in. Um, we've, you know, new restaurants, new, you know, owed closed at the end of December. There's already a clothing store opening next month. Um, we've got a new restaurant opening in the uh, Convino space. Um, so most of the other most of the other landlords are quickly filling their businesses. I've got one right across the street on Crafts Avenue when Glazed went away. Uh, there's now Ouya has, has opened. Um, so we actually see, with the exception of those long-term vacancies of one owner, um, a lot of movement in all those other properties. So we, we don't actually think it's having an impact, but obviously we'd love more restaurants and we'd love you know, more people <laughs> coming to the city. Um, so that's obviously part of the equation when we look at vacancies and we try to work with landlords to get them full. So um, I will also say that some of the vacancies, which may or may not be controversial for people, um, are vacancies that actually have a lease arrangement for one of these marijuana licenses. Um, so it may appear to be vacant, uh, but there are several spaces that do are paying rent uh, because someone has filed a license because they'd like to open a store there. Um, Sam's Pizza is one that um, people may or may not have heard about. Um, and there's, an, um, there's someone who is renting Sam's Pizza while going through the um, licensure process. <coughs> so they won't be serving pizza, but they'll be serving something, something else in the future. So that would be my answer to that. So yeah, the, sometimes when you look at those long ones, the 21 is always budgeted or estimated, so it's always going to look a little different than the actuals. Other questions? Other slide requests? For <laughs> um, I apologize because this is probably an unfair question because you didn't have a slide and you didn't do this comparison. Um, but would you be able to talk at all about um, how our public safety budget compares to the comparison communities that we often talk about um, and you know, what the differences may be? Um, that's another one where we've had slides like that before, which we can pull that data. Um, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, scale, I mean, I, I don't know that, I mean, obviously we have a um, large and busy city with lots of visitors that come to the city. And so we have, you know, we have a, a base population of 28,000, but, you know, on a weekend or during major events, we, uh, you know, we look more like a city of 50 to 60,000, so we get a lot of calls. For assistance, um, and we often many of the calls that we encounter, whether it's traffic accidents, um, are often people that don't live in the city, um, as sort of a measure of, of visitorship. Um, we're also because we're a regional center, and we're where lots of things like the hospital um, and lots of services are located. We also, I think, provide additional public safety services. So. Um, with, I, can, I can get you that comparative data in terms of where we spend versus others. I will say I think that we have um, some of the best public safety departments in Western Massachusetts. We, you know, our, our police department is a fully accredited. Um, our fire rescue is a leader in terms of innovation around EMS and um, you know, EMS equipped ambulances and other, um, other innovations that they put into place. 
I think our run times or our response times are some of the best in Western Massachusetts. So um, I think we have, you know, we provide really good public safety services. Um, you know, when I mentioned uh, the Viz uh, visual budget tool recently, and you know, when I look at my uh, tax bill for my, you know, home every year, um, I'm basically paying $25 a month for fire rescue, and I'm paying $25 a month for the police department. Um, and I'm, I've, I've, I've had to call both of those. Um, it's, we don't, some of us never have had to. We obviously hope we never have to. Um, but when we have to use those services, knowing that we have the type of public safety departments that we have, I think that is a value to the community. But obviously when you look at what you're paying, you know, $25 a month, um, I would say that that's a pretty incredible value. Um, and considering what we pay a month for these and what we, without even looking at the bill, um, or what we pay for cable TV or what we pay for many other services. So, um, so but we can try to get you some comparative data. Um, again, you know, there's always a grain of salt because different communities may um, have different, you know, d different sizes or they may, um, they, you know, they may not have a dispatch department. So there may be some differences there, but we can try to provide you the data um, for those comparison communities using DOR uh, data. That would be great. I okay. concur about our excellence in public safety. And so I think any opportunity we have to sort of point out some of the services that we have that other communities don't have mm -hmm. and how that, um, how it's important to provide those services and that we are grateful for them mm -hmm. and the value they bring to us is, is good. Exactly, yeah. Councillor Nash. Mr. Mayor, um, so this is, this is now my third uh, budget presentation like this and, um, and once again, it is full of useful information and that um, it's, it's evident that we have a very complicated uh, budget system, but it's also uh, very well run. It's always, I'm always impressed at the level of detail, uh, both in terms of uh, what uh, we look at as a city, but also looking at the surrounding community so that we're able to put things in focus. Um, the other thing that, that's always clear to me is that, um, that we don't have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. And the, it's that we have this partnership with the state where we've been level, we continue, continue to be level funded every year. Um, you know, 1% in my mind is level funding. Uh, while we're, we're seeing uh, annual increases in three to 4% just to meet our basic needs. And that, um, and so as we go to the voters to ask them to support um, that gap uh, that um, that the the real issue is the lack of funding from the state and that's that's why we need to revisit this every five years that we hit these cliffs um, and oh, the last thing what is this? <coughs> where'd it go all right anyway um, so that, that was my point, and I want to thank you for the presentation once again. Thank you. And we'll, this will be online, and we'll send it out to you. I know some of the numbers were kind of small, and I apologize, but we'll send it all out to you so you'll have a copy of it. And it will be posted on the website uh, tomorrow, so members of the public who want to look at it can do so as well. Are there other questions? Um, Councilor Jerry. Um, I first want to put in a plug. Uh, this year is the 2020 Census. And um, it's important that we have a complete count, not just because that affects our representation, uh, but also because uh, it affects how much money we get from state and federal sources. Um, so, you know, we'll be, I'm on the complete count committee for the census for our city, and we'll be working on uh, working with all the city councilors and hopefully school committee members, you know, getting out the word and the importance. Um, of getting that, of reaching every population that we have. Um, and then a question was about the senior exemptions. Um, when the asset and income limits, are, are they a, on a scale in terms of if, if I'm a dollar over the income limits, I get nothing, but if I'm a dollar under, do I get $1,000? There's a formula, yeah. Um, I, I, 
can. You know, there is a cutoff. I mean, there's there's a cutoff. Yeah, that's okay. yeah, that's definitely the, the the limits are set by those by those you know limits under the law. So, um, but but the assessor works with people um, to come in. It's confidential. They provide all their financial data, um, and she tries to work with them to make sure that you know. To, to get them eligibility for as many pro programs as they're eligible for. As you and I have talked about before, your home doesn't count towards your assets. Right. I think you would just want to clarify that for people so when they see that asset, that's not counted. It's everything other than your home in terms of assets. Um, and there's also, there's also state programs as well um, in terms of exemptions that are available on state taxes, uh, your state income taxes. Um, and then one other program which you know, may or may not work for some people. Um, we do have the ability uh, for some taxpayers um, to actually um, defer their taxes um, if, when they're at a certain age. So they would, um, they would defer their taxes over time with a lower interest rate that occurs than a normal, you know, someone who wasn't paying their taxes. And then, um, you know, and then at, at, at sort of like a reverse mortgage. Um, where when you when you um, when you're no longer with us, then the mortgage is paid off from the proceeds of the sale. Um, so there's even that option. That's a that's again a state program that's allowed. Um, so there are some other tools um, that are available for people um, to look at. And again, our assessor meets with people all the time and provides information on that. Okay. okay. Um, Any questions from our friends at Smith Locational? Um, and we're, we're hoping that in a future year, our friends from Smith Vocational will actually be sitting at the table with us. Um, as a quirk of our charter, um, I think we, we, we use some boilerplate language about around, um, you know, the city council and school committee um, not realizing that Northampton has two separate school districts with two separate governing boards, city school committee and the Smith Vogue trustees. So we actually, um, but I always invite them to this meeting, but we are going to try to, one of the amendments to the charter is making sure that the definition of a school committee in our charter includes both of our school districts, because um, they're also part of this budget process as well. So we're gonna, get, gonna need to get longer tables <laughs> and bigger glasses to see the screen. Um, okay, um, if there's no further questions, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Is there a second? All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And this concludes the joint meeting of the school committee and city council of January 30th. Thank you. <laughs>